Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, traders. We are coming at you with the 61st episode of the Performante podcast. It's August 18th, 2021, and we've got a pretty jam-packed episode just to cover the topics here. We're going to be talking about some of our recent altcoin picks, specifically Solana as a market leader. We're going to be diving into the Taliban and their perspective on crypto entrepreneurs. We've also got some interesting news from Kevin O'Leary, and we're going to be covering some of the Poly Network crypto hacker drama. We've also got some interesting news coming out of the PCC ecosystem and how we're going to be launching our own crypto in the coming weeks and months. And last but not least, we got to pay our respects to Elon Musk and Mark Cuban, two up and coming legends of the space, let's call it. So just an overview, jam-packed episode, and I'll pass it on over to Keith to jump right in. All right, we're going to get right into Solana first. Had an absolute massive pump after our nice triangle squeeze that we've been talking about since really like mid to late May. Um, after our major push to the downside, we saw a lot of alts pull back 50, 60 or more percentage. And the relatively strong tokens that we've been talking about, things surprisingly like Doge, Solana, obviously, Cardano is another one that we've been keeping a close eye on that has been absolutely mooning recently. So just want to let everyone know, uh, we do think that this is basically the altcoin season 2.0. We've seen relatively strong tokens already outperform Bitcoin, like Solana, like Cardano, like Doge. Ethereum's kind of up there, um, Cake's up there. So if you are not in our Discord already, we are talking about more and more speculative, smaller projects that could yield some very lucrative returns. So um, if you're not in there, I highly, highly suggest joining our Discord. Going to jump right into the second thing or the second topic of the day. Um, hopefully everyone is aware of the Taliban uh, <laughs> kind of overtaking Afghanistan, but they've actually declared Afghanistan a safe space for crypto entrepreneurs, um, which is kind of a, a pretty interesting place. I don't know if I would want to be going over there, but um, after they've con started to control Afghanistan, uh, and basically dissolved their entire gov government, um, they actually are kind of providing job opportunities, I guess, in the world of crypto, uh, which is pretty unbelievable. I don't know how safe it is, but um, we do see countries like Afghanistan, Iran, enter the crypto space pretty early with their mining and um, th their um, ability to kind of open up into new technologies. Also, the fact that they don't like using the United States dollar to transact commodities is a, is a major part of it. But um, we do see Afghanistan um, and specifically the Taliban <laughs> opening up to the world of crypto. Um, got any thoughts on that there, uh, Nathan? It's interesting to see this transition. I got no idea what the prospective benefits, if it would be a <laughs> yeah. tax benefit program, or maybe they're going to create a crypto ecosystem incubator within the Islamic Emirate of <laughs> Afghanistan. It's quite the interesting statement to make. Obviously, we've seen Iran make a successful transition towards a BTC-centric country with their massive government subsidies for Bitcoin mining. And perhaps Afghanistan will do the same with their opium reserves. Maybe they're going to figure out a way to turn opium into Satoshis. Who knows? Obviously, it's absolutely horrific what is going on in Afghanistan with all of the expats leaving and kind of the trajectory that that country is on and kind of the revision of the progress that's happened over the last 20 years. It's absolutely terrible to see. But at the end of the day, it's kind of not satire, but... To see them take the stance with crypto, there is some level of irony with it because they say they're not stuck in their barbaric past, but yet here they are. And so for the next topic here, we're going to be talking about Mr. Wonderful, no one less than Kevin O'Leary himself. He's become quite pro-crypto in the public spotlight recently. For those who don't know, he is one of the lead figures of Shark Tank. And uh, he recently said that the financial middlemen should find jobs shining shoes because decentralized <laughs> finance or DeFi technology will make their roles obsolete. I think he's really dove into the space recently and understood how one central program or code can act as a can act and replace what a bank does to provide attractive APY to their customers. 
And it's interesting because many years ago he was uh, he was criticizing Bitcoin. He didn't believe it was hard money, but now he's really jumped in the river with two feet, and he's really found his footing within the crypto space and has become quite the advocate for the crypto companies, specifically the FTX exchange. He has become an advisor on their board in exchange for an equity stakehold, which is quite the interesting move because obviously FTX is one of the larger uptrending exchanges in the world. And Kevin O'Leary is now on their board of advisors in exchange for a piece of equity. So he not only has his own skin in the game with capital, he has got a literal equity stakehold in one of the biggest exchanges in the world. Further, uh, on a CNBC interview, I believe it was last week, he advocated for 7% of total portfolio to be allocated to cryptocurrency. He didn't specify which cryptocurrencies he owns and what proportion, uh, but he did say he's He's a big believer in both Bitcoin and Ethereum. But given that he is a proponent of DeFi, I can imagine he's probably got some Aave, some Celsius, and some uh, alternative instruments like that. Maybe he's a DGen like us and has a fat <laughs> cake farm. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, maybe. He definitely did make that switch very quick. Uh, he was bashing Bitcoin, saying... Um, it's not money, it's not currency, it's not like gold, it's just a digital token that collectibles purchase, and he's made the switch 180 degrees, so great to see, and, you know, maybe eventually we'll see the entire Shark Tank become DeFi DGens, because we already have two. Um, we already have Mr. Wonderful, and we already have um, Mark Cuban, which, which are two ones, so we'll see where this takes us, but we do see more influ influential individuals in the finance, investing, and tech space turning a more positive light or poor's positive side into the world of crypto. So definitely really positive to see. I can only imagine the conversations that happen behind the scenes when they're recording Shark Tank. It's probably Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary just staring at their phones like, yo, man, you catch <laughs> you catch that doge pump? You in? <laughs> that you, re re refreshing <laughs> all the time. <laughs> you want 100x right now, Britt? What's your leverage? Yeah. What's your API right now? And also just one last final story covering Kevin O'Leary. He, it looks like he is investing in a company and might have a large equity shareholder in a DeFi company called WonderFi, which is kind of attuned to his central brand of being Mr. Wonderful. And he says that WonderFi is preparing a platform where people can trade assets and earn interest in the DeFi space, but kind of orientated towards more of the more basic consumer that might not have the technical knowledge to leverage the more complicated decentralized applications. And he really just wants to create a consumer centric product. So honestly, great moves for the space, great moves for Kevin. And uh, it's a good chuckle to only imagine what happens behind the scenes with the two crypto degens compared to maybe the more conservative investors on the Shark Tank. Yeah, definitely. It'd be interesting to see what they say to the other Shark Tank members that aren't in crypto. It'd kind of be a cool thing to eavesdrop in on. But um, moving on to the next topic, we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting situation this one hacker got into. Uh, he basically conducted a major attack last week. Um, and took like $600 million worth of tokens. Um, but because he was able to actually hack in and crack into it, uh, he is basically saving the company, which is the Poly Network, from the hack by actually conducting it himself. But he's not going to give the full $600 million that he took back to Poly Network until, in his eyes, um, is safe and ready for everyone. Um, so not only is he basically identifying major cracks in the system, but Poly Network, as a thank you, actually provided a $500,000 bounty or like restoration uh, to that hacker because of the, I guess, work that they've put in. And they even offered a position as chief security advisor. So a hacker, in short, hacked a system, took $600 million, is not giving that $600 million back until he or she deems it safe, and also is getting a position within Poly Network's company plus a $500,000 reward and in a position as the chief security advisor. So a whirlwind of events for this hacker, but um, it does look like because he is trying to promote security and safety and best practices and seemingly is eventually going to give that $600 million back worth of tokens. He seems like he's getting a reward and a position in the Poly Networks um, community. So 
pretty unbelievable uh, events or, or series of events that have taken place, but uh, it does look like he's leaning towards the more positive side of, um, I guess, either the light side or dark side when you are a hacker. Yeah, it's a little bit sus because, I mean, the timeline's pretty funny. He stole $600 million, claiming to be a white knight looking to save the project. Started selling the shitcoin components of what he stole. And then the Poly Network released a super terrible PR statement being like, you'll give the money back if you know what's good for you kind of vibe. Exchanges started blacklisting. And then this, in my opinion, is where it gets super funny is everyone could see the wallet addresses that the hacker had moved the funds to and people started a begging for money they were sending them one usdt being like hey send me 20k please <laughs> which is in itself is kind of funny it's just people shooting their shot trying to get some of that forbidden capital <laughs> and then people started sending them money laundering tips to like open business accounts in certain jurisdictions or different websites to rinse the Bitcoin through in order to avoid international blacklisting. And I guess in exchange, people were hoping for more of the forbidden fruit. That, hey, if I give this guy a money laundering tip, maybe he'll give me a couple of Ethereum. He even sent 1,337, like leet, I guess, as the gamers call it, Ethereum to one random person. For no apparent rhyme or reason, that person just got gifted basically 1,300 Ethereum, <laughs> which is pretty funny. And he's given back a significant proportion of it. There's 200 million still in limbo, but he says he will give it back when everyone is ready. And when that 200 million is returned, he will be given the $500,000 bounty and chief security advisor should he choose to accept it. It's just interesting. Honestly, it's kind of sus. I wouldn't be surprised if this was like an inside job and this was their way of rug pulling without rug pulling and fixing the bug without having it someone else do it. Because the timeline's pretty wacky. The PR statement was awful. It, there's just, it, if it smells bad, it is bad. And in this instance, there's just too many components in play for it to be a fully organic hack. Because the fact that they postpartum offered a $500,000 bounty basically to the person that brought this organization to their knees and potentially closed their business doesn't quite <laughs> add up. But who knows? Only time will tell as the full story comes to light. Hopefully he gives the remaining $200 million back because ultimately that does belong to other people. And it's not the best interest of the crypto community to have these massive heists and hacks happen. It just makes us look bad. So moving on to our next story here, we're going to be talking about the Performante community coin. First and foremost, our white paper is available on our Discord. It will be available on our website shortly. We're just creating a separate portal for our crypto ecosystem. Um, there's a couple of key components of the crypto that we want to cover. First, it's a social crypto where basically the more you engage in our community, the more you'll get rewarded. We're going to be aggressively airdropping our early community members. Basically, the longer you've been in our community, the more PCC you'll get. And in instance, there will be a lot of ways that you can earn PCC, whether it be helping others, providing knowledge, insight, and value, engaging with our social media content. And there will be a marketplace for skills called the Bounty Network. So let's say you need some graphic design work. You can put... For example, your business logo, put a bounty for 100 PCC out there, people submit, and you pick who wins. It's going to be a skills marketplace, and we really want this to be basically a template, a template infrastructure for how social cryptos can be integrated within Discord. And in the larger picture, we will also be creating our first set of NFTs. The first set will be 150 and around half of them will be airdropped to the more OG community members, let's call it. And just as like a sign of thank you, and the other half will be a lot more exclusive. We don't want to give all the details just yet, but we are expecting this to be a pretty fun, intriguing, and engaging project for our community. And obviously, as everyone knows, the NFT market has been absolutely insane recently with some of these crypto punks selling for hundreds of millions of dollars and really the profile picture trend continuing. So... If you haven't joined our Discord, there will be a link in the description. Alternatively, you can type in performante.ca into your web browser and you can get a Discord link there. We'd love to see you. 
because ultimately we're just getting started with our Performante community coin. We've come a long way. There's so much backend work that has to be done with this project because we don't want to have a rug pull like Poly Network. We don't want anyone <laughs> stealing our funds. Better safe than sorry. But the best way to stay in touch with what we're doing and the trajectory we're heading on is just kick around the Discord. Yeah, definitely. A lot of uh, extremely exciting upcoming things, I think. Because there's like two different sides of the NFTs. I won't give too much away, but I think the unique NFTs will definitely provide a lot of interest and a lot of familiarity with the crypto space. If you've been around the space for a little while, know the key figures. I think you'll have a lot of fun and I think there will be um, some NFTs that will make you laugh, make you basically just want to be a part of it. So definitely stay, uh, stay aware, stay in our Discord and be excited for that and, and the things to come. And the last thing we'll be touching on is the new story coming from Elon Musk and Mark Cuban. Uh, basically, they're both agreeing that Dogecoin is a strong medium of exchange. And uh, Cuban, Mark Cuban accepts Dogecoin for his Dallas Mavericks, for like the merchant stuff. And he actually praises the token's strong community, which is... I agree with, but I don't know if I'd agree with um, the Dogecoin being a strong medium of exchange. You could really look at anything as a medium of exchange, even before money as we know it, like paper currency, people use shells, people use like flowers, whatever you can kind of think of. Like even kids use little like candies or little Tamagotchi toys. So all really a medium of exchange is, is, is a way for individuals within an uh, environment or ecosystem or, or economy to exchange goods and services in a very easily frictionless way. So if you're looking at it just from like a very simple approach, 100% um, Dogecoin could be a medium of exchange. But if you're looking at it from a usability, scalability, there's a lot of tokens that I think would be a better suited project. For example, like what that we talked about at the beginning of the uh, podcast about Solana, you know, 10,000 transactions in a second or something crazy along the lines of that. Um, being able to utilize that sort of technology, I think would be really beneficial and being able to have like a pro programmable money um, with smart contracts and stuff would be a really interesting thing. But uh, it does look like there's just more and more hype going into Doge. And to go back into the start of the podcast, again, we talked about relative strength and we have over 25 different altcoins all on a single chart. And we analyze the relative strength, the weakness compared to basically the rest of the major altcoins that are in the top 25 of the coin market cap, largest market cap tokens. And we see Doge, when you're looking from 2021, actually be third in terms of relative strength. Um, we see th some things like Luna, QNT do really well, Maddox doing really well, but Doge is up there. And although it doesn't have the story of high utility, um, it does seem to have an increasing amount of conviction from high profile people like Elon Musk and Mark Cuban, that it has a strong community, has a network effect, and it has the ability to actually be somewhat of a medium of exchange. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because obviously they're both stakeholders in that cryptocurrency. So in that instance, it could be considered a little bit sus pumping what they own. But Mark <laughs> Cuban also came forward and said that he only owns $500 a Doge. So maybe it's a bit more wholesome than that. The Dallas Mavericks, the team that Mark Cuban owns, do accept Doge for their merchandise and basketball team uh, ticket sales. And further, he will be announced that there will be a special discount for people who decide to pay for Doge for their summer sale. So as Elon Musk loves to say, fate loves irony. And this meme crypto started in 2013, but we're seeing it kind of come to fruition as time goes on in 2021. And so just to tease the next podcast episode that we're going to talk about, we are going to briefly cover some of the reverse repo operations that have been in the works recently, let's call it. Jay Powell and the goons at the Fed have been absolutely pumping the financial markets with these reverse repos. Specifically, on average, it's been over a trillion dollars a day for the last seven market days. So going all the way back until August 9th, we can see that $1 trillion of reverse repo operations have happened per day. And what makes this particularly concerning and evident of a shift of train, chain, trend towards inflation, the March 2020 crisis when the stock market was gapping down every day, 
the largest repo operation at that point in time had been $500 billion. And now we're seeing double that on a daily occurrence. We're seeing that trajectory. We're seeing that momentum. We're seeing that M2 money stock explode. And basically, it's like pumping an air, pumping in air to a bike tire with a hole in it. It requires more and more air, more and more pressure just to maintain some level of usability. And this economy is thriving on cheap debt and repo operations. Well said, definitely. Um, we'll definitely get into more of that. We'll look at some charts as well. We'll bring some key pieces of data that will um, allow us to explain our perspective of the global macro environment a little bit better. So definitely stay tuned for that. Just as one little kind of sneak peek um, into looking at the data, in 2008, there was less than a trillion dollars in the monetary base, which is basically the amount of money in circulation. Um, there was around $900 billion in September 2008, right when the uh, global financial crisis was going on. And that's where they started to really print an excess amount of currency, um, less than a trillion. And, and we did a trillion dollars a day this week. So um, if you're looking at it in that perspective, it's pretty unbelievable. We'll definitely talk about it more in the next podcast. But I will end off um, saying th thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, I'll end off the rest of the podcast by handing it over to Nathan. It's been August 18th, the 61st episode of the Performante podcast. I appreciate the time you've taken to tune in. Stay safe. Take care, everyone.